Welcome back, fight fans, to episode number 194A of the Neutral Corner Boxing Podcast. I am your host, Michael Montero for BoxingMonthly.com and Boxing Monthly Magazine. So we had a huge, huge weekend in boxing, right? We had fights Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. So we're going to jump right into it in a minute here. But uh, first, we got to hit some news and notes. Before I get started, guys, I hope you had fun at the Pro Gray Taylor fight party. We had a great response for it Saturday. It was a hell of a lot of fun and um, just enjoyed it. And we're going to do it again this Saturday, Canelo Kovalev fight party. So we're going to be back on the zone and uh, having some drinks and chopping up the fight with you guys. So your homework, your fee that I ask of you is to spread the word about the Canelo Kovalev fight party. I'll get the link posted uh, later in the week, I'm not going to do it yet, but later in the week, I'll get a link up there and everything so you guys can start sharing it, getting it out there. We can watch the fight together, chop it up, just like we did with Pro Grade Taylor, which, tur- which turned out to be an awesome fight. And it was really, really fun just um, calling that fight with you guys. And look, most of us scoring it together, watching it live, we're all kind of in the same ballpark. So uh, that, that tells me that Uh, You guys are knowledgeable fight fans. I consider myself a a pretty decent scorer of fights. We might be off by a round or two or something like that, but we're all pretty much in unison in agreement that Taylor eked it out, but man, Progre really narrowed the gap there in the last two rounds. We'll talk more about that in a second. Okay, so for some quick news news and notes, and you guys saw the headline of this video where I talked about Loma, Duck, and Haney. Now, obviously, I'm being facetious. I'm having a little fun. I'm trolling. And that's just in response to some of the things I'm seeing on Twitter and on YouTube, on all the social media. There's a lot of people talking about this because of the franchise championship thing. So I'm going to get into that real quick. But first, I just want to talk about the World Boxing Super Series Cruiserweight Finale between Dortikos and Bredis. Uh, The WBO title may not be on the line. Now, Bredis fought Christoph Glovaki back in June. I think it was June 15, but correct me if I'm wrong on that date. I think it was back in June. And you guys remember how that fight ended. Referee Robert Byrd completely mismanaged that fight. It was atrocious, just a foul fest. And it was in Latvia, where Bredis is from. He basically admitted that he fouled Glovaki after the bell. It was crazy, right? It was crazy. The WBO title was involved with that. I guess that Glovaki and his team, they had a, um, a protest. They filed a protest. I, the WBO is kind of being unclear about their ruling. They're kind of saying that they went against Glovaki's protest, but they're also kind of saying they went along with it. So I don't know exactly what they're going to do yet, but I do know that the World Boxing Super Series finale, the Cruiserweights, That's going to go ahead as scheduled. They're not delaying it for a sanctioning organization. They're not going to force Bradis Glovaki to fight again. I think the WBO might. Now, I I, I don't think there's been an official ruling yet. But I think that they might rule that eventually that if Bradis wants to keep that WBO title or if Dortikos ends up defeating him, that they're going to have to fight Glovaki within a certain amount of days. They're obviously not. It's going to be Dortikos and, and Bredis that fight. So I think that WBO title is going to get stripped maybe. Govaki will fight for a vacant WBO, something like that. That situation is still in flux. So I just wanted to give you guys the latest and greatest. It's kind of murky. Um, okay, so let's talk about Vasily Lomachenko. So you guys already know he gets booted or elevated, however you want to call it, to the franchise champion by the WBC during their big convention bash in Mexico uh, over the last couple weeks. And Devin Haney is bumped from interim champ to full or regular or whatever term you want to use, WBC champ, via an email. His team you know, receives a message saying, hey, guess what? Loma's the franchise champ, so you're the champ now, champ. Here you go. Enjoy your fresh, shiny new belt. It costs XYZ. Please send you know, the check in the mail. So that's how that turned out. And there's a lot of people saying that Lomachenko ducked Haney, avoided Haney. There's people saying that he requested to be franchise champ so he wouldn't have to fight Haney. So I want to just clarify a few things, okay? I haven't heard anything official from Team Lomachenko or from Top Rank that they went to the WBC and requested to be the WBC franchise champ. But 
Devin Haney became the interim champion or whatever the hell the WBC calls it a month ago. One month ago. Now, correct me if I'm wrong here, guys, but generally speaking, you get a certain amount of time to fight your mandatory. And the WBC, in unification situations, will negotiate and extend deadlines. They've done it a million times. They're going to do it uh, for the Canelo-Golovkin rematch, the whole situation with the BC, the IBF. Remember, that goes back to Charlo and Derevyanchenko, right? That whole thing. So they do it all the time. And that would have happened here if that were the case. I find it very, very hard to believe that Lomachenko, a few weeks after Devin Haney becomes his mandatory officially, goes to Grandpa Bob and, and WBC and says, hey, man, we, we, I don't want to face this guy. Can we go ahead and bump myself to franchise champion so we don't have to fight him? Think about the timeline of this, guys. Everybody this entire year has known the plan that top rank in Lomachenko's team wanted to do. They were going to fight Campbell for that vacant title, unify, and then they're going to fight the Comey Lopez winner around the Super Bowl in February, barring any injuries or freak circumstance. So everyone knows that's their timeline. That's, that's their plan. That's one thing I like about top rank is they'll let you know what their plan is when they have one like this. Everyone knows what Lomachenko is going to do, including the WBC. So if you're going to strip a guy or a guy's going to come to you asking to be stripped so he could be the franchise champion, wouldn't Lomachenko and his team do this after the Colme Lopez fight or after February when they have their fight and they unify everything? Wouldn't he wait till then so he could keep his WBC title, claim all the titles, and then if he was going to duck Haney, that's when you duck because you'd want to have all the titles. That's their whole point. That's their business plan. They've made it very, very clear. They've been very transparent. That's what they want to do. So I find it hard to believe that the timing of this thing, it just doesn't make, it just doesn't work. It doesn't add up with what top rank and team Lomachenko want to do. If their entire design was to try to unify titles and then duck Devin Haney and go a different route because they want no part of them, why not wait until after February when they in, in their eyes, when they beat the winner between Comey Lopez. That would be, from a business perspective, from a PR perspective, the right way to do it if you're trying to save face and grab all those titles because that's the plan. It just so happens that before all that is the WBC convention. And Mauricio Suleiman likes to have big news to announce at his convention. All of them do. All these guys that do it. So... What's bigger news than we're bumping Lomachenko to the franchise champion? That's big news because it involves a boxing star. Lomachenko is one of the stars of boxing internationally. It also involves getting into Devin Haney business before his next fight. Because now instead of waiting, let's say the scenario I played out, right? I laid out for you. Let's say that played out. And Lomachenko, let's say Lopez beats uh, Comey. And then Lomachenko beats Lopez in February, unifies all the titles. And then the March dumps him and says, I'm moving down to 130. We're moving down to 130. I don't want these titles anymore. Then Mauricio Suleiman, between now and then, you have to figure that Devin Haney is going to have a fight, either really late this year or early next year. And that fight would be in defense of his interim title. But now Mauricio and the WBC are in business with Devin Haney being the full champion the next time he gets a fight. So I just think there's more money in them, in it for them doing it this way. I think that they get into the Devin Haney business. He's with Matchroom. He's on the zone. They have a completely different business plan over there, what they want to do with Devin Haney. You already know the Lomachenko business plan with top rank. After unifying everything with the winner of Comey Lopez, they've made it very clear they may move back down. They may start doing some weight jumping and just going for the big fights and not necessarily defending the lightweight title over and over. They might do a one-off at 140 for somebody like a Mikey Garcia. They might drop down to 130 if something opens up there for them. So two different business plans. The WBC now gets to be involved in both of them. I think ultimately that's what this is about. Also, um, Lomachenko in several interviews has said that he is more than willing to fight Devin Haney, Javante Tank Davis, and others. 
So for people to just be flat out accusing him of ducking a guy who's been his mandatory for less than a month, when he fought for a world title in his second professional fight, fought for a world title in his third professional fight against a guy that people like Leo Santa Cruz have avoided for years, right? Not a lot of people are rushing to fight Gary Russell Jr. So I just find it very, very hard to believe. I, people were saying Lomachenko wanted no part of Teofimo Lopez a year ago. They were saying, oh, he's going to avoid this guy. He wants no part of him. They're going to use the weight thing as an excuse. Whatever. And now he's going to fight him in February because I, I do think Lopez is going to be Kome. So this is if this was some grand design to avoid Devin Haney for the time being and build that fight up for a year or two. That's obviously more on Grandpa Bob and the folks at top rank who are designing and outlining Lomachenko's career. The fighters don't avoid anybody. But I just, ha- I just find it very hard to believe that this is Lomachenko avoiding a mandatory when he's been willing to fight everybody so far in his career. This is 100% business. The WBC wanted into the Devin Haney slash matchroom slash DAZN business while remaining in the Lomachenko business. It's the same thing at middleweight. They wanted in the Charlo slash PBC business slash Fox slash Showtime business while remaining in the Canelo Alvarez business. That's why they named Canelo the franchise champion. And you know damn well, Deontay Wilder, I've been saying this for a while, he's going to be the next franchise champion after, I thought it'd be before his, his rematch with Luis Ortiz, but then Dillian White screwed it up by testing positive for performance-enhancing drugs. I guarantee freaking you, if Dillian White had not tested positive for PEDs and there was no B sample and UCAD investigation we're waiting on, Deontay Wilder would have been announced as the third franchise champion during this convention. The WBC was waiting for this convention to make these announcements. This was on the books. This was planned long ago. And they were going to elevate Dillian White to the WBC champion and make Deontay Wilder the franchise champion. Dillian White screwed that up by cheating. So there you go. Um, Okay, that's enough about that. I I just, I had to get that off my chest because, look, I I just don't think Vasily Lomachenko is a ducker. Now, if two years go by and he hasn't fought Devin Haney, he hasn't fought Gervonta Davis, and those fights are available to him, and he's campaigning in their weight class still, then we can have that discussion. But you, you can't be ducking a guy that's been your mandatory for like three weeks. That's, that's absolutely ridiculous. And as far as I know, per, the, the bylaws with this WBC franchise thing are very sketchy and kind of murky. But I don't think a fighter can just call up Mauricio and say, hey, can you make me franchise champion? I think this is something the WBC designates. That's the way I understand it. At least that's the way I worked with Canelo. And some of the people that were saying Canelo's ducking Charlo. Again, one thing about Canelo Alvarez, I don't think he ducks people. Did they wait out Gennady Golovkin and do a little business with that? Yeah. But I don't think Canelo Alvarez is ducking anybody. Do I think he's ducking Charlo and asked to be franchise champion? No. I think eventually that that fight could happen. I hope it does. But we'll talk about that another day. Okay, let's review some fights, guys. Let's get right into the big one. Let's just jump right into it, and then we'll talk about the other stuff. Because I know this is the one you guys want to talk about. And then we'll go to the Q&A. Um, let's see here. Make sure I got the chat up. Oh, I got this message thing. Okay, I can see you guys chat. All right. Um, okay, O2 Arena. London, last Saturday, World Boxing Super Series finale on the zone. 140-pound super lightweight finale between Regis Progre and Josh Taylor. Josh Taylor improves to 16-0 with a majority decision win over Progre, who drops to 24-1. Taylor unifies the WBA, IBF, Ali Trophy, and Ring Championship all in one night. Fantastic fight with back-and-forth action up until the final bell. The final round. The momentum kept swinging back and forth in this. It was an awesome fight. If you guys haven't watched my live commentary, check it out. It was, it was, it was a lot of fun, man. And again, I think we were all were kind of seeing the same fight, which is good. That, that's really good. Because when you see a great fight like this, there's always going to be some, um, some people that you know see some rounds differently. It's going to go back and forth. But if we're all kind of in the same 
realm together, then that's good. I saw one of you guys saying that I'm buffering. Uh, if I'm buffering, check your, just refresh your browser, man, because everything's good on my end, guys. Again, having a little technical difficulties tonight. I don't know what the hell is going on, but if I'm buffering, refresh your web browser because everything should be good. Okay, um, scores. 117-112, which was a bad score. That's just a bad score from Matteo Montella from Italy. I don't agree with that score. One score, 115-113 for Taylor. That's a good score. Oddly enough, that judge who had 115-113 gave the 12th round to Josh Taylor, which I thought was not a good score. And then one judge had a 114-114. Now, a lot, of, a lot of people have made a lot out of the fact that that one judge scored the 12th round for Taylor. And had he scored that right, then it would be a majority draw, right? Because two, two judges would have it to draw, and then that one scorecard was just too wide. Here's the thing, guys. This was never going to end in a draw. What did I say during the broadcast? What did we talk about last Thursday? World Boxing Super Series, it's the finale. They have a fourth judge there. Right, so the fourth judge, where they would have went to in the case of a draw, had a one sixteen one twelve for Taylor, which is a good score. So ultimately, Josh Taylor was going to win, even if that one judge scored the twelfth round for Pro Gray, which he should have. That that twelfth round Regis Pro Gray won. So for him to give it to Taylor, that's a little sketchy, a little weird. But what you would have ended up having is that fourth judge coming in and overturning, overriding everyone else. Josh Taylor would have won regardless. So a little controversy there, but in the end, it doesn't really matter. All right. The right guy won. The right guy got the decision. Pro Gray couldn't have been classier after suffering the first defeat of his career. He said it was a close fight. Of course, he said he felt he won. Every fighter is going to say that. But he said, look, the better man won and all props to Taylor. I mean, he, he was very classy. And Taylor acted a little cocky and arrogant in the moment. I didn't really like that. But you guys have seen the videos of them hanging out together the following day at the fight hotel. They both had busted up eyes. Taylor really had a bad eye, but Progray's right eye was pretty bad himself. And they were taking videos together, pictures together. They've been tweeting each other back and forth. You could see that they shared those 12 rounds in a classic fight together. They're brothers for life now after sharing 12 rounds like that, right? And so anyway, Taylor, I didn't like the way he acted in the moment, but the next day or so, he came around and was acting very humble and full of class. Both guys showing a lot of class. I'd love to see a rematch. Would love to. I don't think it's going to happen right away, but maybe down the line. This is one that they can have two years from now, three years from now. And maybe, maybe because they're probably eventually going to both move up to welterweight. Who the hell wouldn't want to see a rematch between these two in 2021, in t- even in 2022, if they keep winning at welterweight? You know, don't get me wrong. I'd love to see it next, but that's obviously not what's going to happen. And deservingly so. Both of these guys earned, I think, a soft touch. After going through the, the, the tournament like that, they earned a soft touch. Now, of course, what do we want to see? We want to see Taylor fight Ramirez to unify the whole damn thing. And right now in the division, I think that Josh Taylor is the champ. I think him beating Pro Gray, he's not number one. He's the champ. And at Ring Magazine, we gave him the Ring Magazine championship. We talked about this at the Ring Ratings Committee. We went back and forth about it. After Ramirez beat Hooker earlier this year, we kind of, we chatted about this on the Ring Ratings Committee. And we said, look, man, this Taylor-Pro Gray fight, does Ramirez's win alter that? We had a discussion about it. Should, it, should we change it? Should we sanction that fight for the ring championship? And ultimately, we decided yes, because these guys went through a tournament. And they really were the number one and number two in the division. So there's a new lineage now. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and use the word lineal. The lineal champ, the champ of the division is Josh Taylor. The number one contender is Jose Carlos Ramirez. The number two contender is Regis Progre. You got to put Ramirez above Progre right now because he has two titles undefeated. And his win over Maurice Hooker is nothing to sneeze at. That, that's a good win, a very good win. So he is the number one contender right now to Taylor. Those two got to fight next year. Are they going to fight right away? No. Taylor needs to rest. 
He needs to heal up that eye. He needs to maybe have a soft touch to get some rust off after that uh, healing and rehab with that eye because he's not going to be able to spar for a while. But then maybe toward the summer, maybe even you build it up to, you know, in the fall next year, you have maybe Ramirez comes over to the zone. If Taylor wants to come over to the United States and fight maybe in Vegas or something, that could end up on ESPN pay-per-view. There's different options here. I'd love to see Ramirez go over to London and go back to O2, where they will do a massive crowd. It'll be pay-per-view in the UK, but if they go over and do it that way, it could be on the zone here in the United States, and for you guys, it cost you 10 bucks or $8 and some change, whatever you pay a month for the zone. I think that would be the best scenario for fight fans. For Pro Gray, fights out of Houston. Well, now he's in Los Angeles, but he's been a Houston guy for years. Maurice Hooker's also from Texas, from Dallas. I'd love to see the two of them fight next year. Why the hell not? That'd be a hell of a lot of fun. But he's got crazy options. Pro Gray's stock rose in this fight with the loss. This is one of those cases where both fighters, the stock raised. Uh, so here's the question that's come up. Does Josh Taylor belong on the pound for pound list? And this is something that we argued about in the ring ratings committee as well. And we still haven't made a decision. As of the time I'm recording this, I'll give you guys some inside scoop. (laughs) Four to three, we have voted no. But that might change. That might change. I know Doug Fisher, the editor of the magazine, feels Taylor belongs. And, you know, Doug's vote carries a lot more weight than anybody else's. So he might get in. But, but here's my argument against it, okay? I think Taylor's n- number 11, number 12 right now. My question is, who does he replace? Now, maybe. Manny Pacquiao is like number 10 right now. Maybe he could replace Manny Pacquiao. If you feel that Taylor's wins against Baranchek and Progre are better wins than Pacquiao's last two wins, okay. You can make that argument, and I wouldn't be mad at you. So if you have Taylor coming in at number 10 and replacing Pacquiao, okay. For my money, Pacquiao just had this legendary career, just pulled off an amazing win over Keith Thurman and dominated Thurman. Thurman had some moments in the middle rounds, but he clearly won, right? Taylor struggled against Baranchek, was hurt, ultimately one clearly decisively, but was neck and neck with Pro Gray. So hasn't been dominant. Dominant in spots, the middle rounds of that fight against Pro Gray, he was dominant. He really took control. And I thought, man, is he going to stop Regis Pro Gray? And then Pro Gray proved that he is just a super badass and finished really, really strong. But for my money, okay, right now I still got Pacquiao at number 10. And I got Josh Taylor nipping at his heels, number 11, number 12. Now, if he fights Jose Carlos Ramirez and beats him, he's in there. And he's maybe in the top five, depending on how that fight plays out, okay? For me, though, I'm just, I don't want to jump the gun. He's just short of it. Now, some of you will say, and and this is part of the conversation we had on the Ring Ratings Committee, well, what about Better Biev? Because we brought him in at number nine. We took Mikey Garcia out and put Better Biev in. My reasoning, and a lot of people agreed with me, and you guys can see the post on ringtv.com where it, we show part of the discussion we had. And, and uh, Doug quotes us, the quotes that we had during the discussion. And my argument was, look at Better Biev's win over Oleksandr Vozdik is better than any win Mikey Garcia's ever had, period. And that's the truth. I find it, you can't argue that. It's a better win than any of Mikey Garcia's wins ever. In his whole career. So, yeah, for, and also, Better Biev dropped Vosdik three times and stopped him. He's had 15 fights, he's had 15 stoppage wins. He bulldozes his competition. So, I thought he was worthy of bringing in there at number nine. That's why we put him in. And so, the, the argument is well, man, if we put him in off that win off Vosdik, we got to put Taylor in off the win off of. Progray, and I'm like, yeah, I can understand that, but they're similar but different. Vajdik much more proven, amateur and pro, than Progray. Let's face it, he was. He also was, technically, since everyone loves to use this word, the lineal champion at light heavyweight. So I just rate Beterbi- Better Biev's win 
overbought stick a little bit higher, a little bit higher. Now, I see one of you guys, because you're making a very good comment here. Um, Cor- Como Rebbe. Como Rebbe just said in the chat, huge Better BF fan, but Taylor's resume is better. You know what? You can make an argument. You can make that argument because he beat Baranchek and Progre. And you can say that those two wins are better than any two wins Better BF has. I still think Better BF's win over Vozdik, not just who he beat, but how he beat them, is better than any one win Taylor has. Also, it's the domination of his wins. 15 fights, 15 knockouts, right? He dropped Vozdik three times and stopped him. Taylor, and I also, I got in some trouble with some of you UK guys by saying this on Twitter. Taylor was fighting in his backyard. He's fought his entire career in his backyard. And people were saying, ah, he's Scottish. He's fighting in London. That's not his backyard. Okay, technically, no, he's not. He's from Edinburgh, Scotland. That's about 400 miles north of London. I get it. It's not exactly the same. But it's still the UK. And look, who was the home fighter Saturday and who was the away fighter? The entire crowd in the O2 Arena was booing Regis Progre. All fight week, they were booing Regis Progre. He was the away team. The home team was Progre. If Taylor, Progre's from New Orleans, fought out of Houston, now he lives in LA. If Progre came to the United States and fought Progre in Las Vegas, it wouldn't be Progre's hometown, but it'd be his home turf. It's still America, right? Taylor would have been the away team. So that's what I'm saying. So Taylor did have the advantage, the entire tournament, of fighting over in the UK. He never traveled. Now, Progre didn't either until the finals. I get it, okay? But just again, I'm, half, I'm having to like really, really grasp at straws right here. I'm having to nitpick. That's how close this shit is. So again, if you feel Taylor is in your top 10, I ain't mad at you. I'm not mad at you at all. And I, you can absolutely make that argument. And I'm telling you guys here right now, we're still hashing it out uh, at Ring TV. We might bump him up at Ring, Ring TV and Ring Magazine into the top 10. But right now, for me, he's just outside. I mean, like 10B, 10.5. Because <laughs> I just don't know who in the top 10 right now he replaces. Now, I did see some of you guys on Twitter saying that his resume is better than Oleksandr Usyk's. That is ridiculous. What, some idiot on Twitter who tweeted like 10 times about me over the past week. I had to report this guy and just get his account locked because he was just saying all kinds of nasty, disgusting shit about me. But he was trying to argue that Taylor's last two wins are better than any two wins that Usyk has. That his wins over Bradius and Gassiev. That's ridiculous. Yeah, so Usyk's resume is much better than Josh Taylor's. I think some people go a little too far. I think it's great that the UK fans support their fighters so fiercely. I think that's awesome. But you have to keep objectivity in balance, okay? Let's not jump too far, guys. All right? So let's see here. James Burrell says, Scotland is definitely sovereign and not England. I'm not saying it's England, but it is part of the United Kingdom. And again, it's a one-hour flight from Scotland to London. One-hour flight. That's like me flying from Atlanta to Miami, okay? So if I fought a Scottish guy in Miami, it might not be Atlanta. It's still, come on, man. It's it's a few hundred miles away. So that's what I'm saying here. Just listen to the crowd during the fight. They were going for Taylor. He's been fighting in London and in and around the UK his entire career. He's built a brand there. He was, it was his home turf. Not his hometown, but his home turf. And all those things, when, when you have to nitpick and get into the gray area, what I call in between the black and white, the fine print with these arguments, you have to get to stuff like that. That's why I just like better BF's win over Vostick a little better. And to, to compare Taylor's wins to Alexander Usyk, that's just stupid. That's just Usyk, I think all three of his fights in the World Boxing Super Series were in his opponent's home country. And then he went to London and knocked out Tony Bellew there in his home country, hometown, I think. 
or Bellew, is Bellew from Manchester? I can't remember off the top of my head. I think he might be from London, but that's much different than what Josh Taylor did. And he also, 12-0 shutout over Gassiev, who was a unified world champion. I mean, come on, dude. Like Some of these people are going a little nuts on Twitter. Don V with the Super Chat Pledge. She says, great show as usual, Michael. Thank you. Thank you, Don. I appreciate it. Salute to you, brother. Thank you very, very much. All right, guys. So, uh, okay, Bellew's from Liverpool. Chris Bergen saying Bellew's from, ah, that's right, Liverpool. Okay. So he's not from London. He's from Liverpool. But again, uh, you know what? To quote Eddie Hearn, and I'm not going to say, this, I'm paraphrasing, but my interview I did with him recently, we were talking, we were talking about the differences between promoting in the UK versus promoting in America. And he said it, man. He goes, look, if I promote a show in Liverpool versus London versus Manchester, I, I market it the same way. It's all the UK. In America, I got to market a show differently in Chicago than I do in Los Angeles. Those are two different time zones apart. So there you go, guys. So when you ask a mythical matchup question, but I can't see it. Oh, here we go. Whiskey Dragonfly asks Mike, fantasy matchup. How does Josh Taylor versus Keith Thurman look like? Right now, right now, this version of Keith Thurman, Josh Taylor beats him by decision. I just think that there's enough dog in Taylor. If he could avoid Thurman's big looping punches from the outside, which I think he would, I think he'd smother it and get inside that power. I think he'd win a decision over him. I really, really do. Um, okay, also staying in London, let's finish out that card. Derek Chisora, TKO4 over David Price. This fight was meaningless. It got both guys a little bit of money. That's about it. But it was kind of a meaningless fight. I really think Derek Chisora, so he was supposed to fight Joshua Parker, or I'm sorry, Joseph Parker. I don't know if that fight's still going to happen. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. Right now, Chisora is not rated by the WBO. But if his promotional team can make that change and get him ranked by the WBO. I'm telling you that WBO title is going to be vacant. Usyk's going to fight for it next year. There's a very strong possibility it could be Chisora fighting Usyk for the vacant WBO heavyweight title next year. However, he might have to fight Joseph Parker to get that ranking. Maybe the WBO says, look, winner between Parker, Chisora early next year, Fights Usyk for the vacant title in the spring. Sign me up for some of that shit. I'd love to see it. But this fight was meaningless. Also, Lee Selby, majority decision win over Ricky Burns. Uh, For me, it just... Look, this fight was okay. It kind of... It was a pretty good fight. But to me, it just didn't live up to the expectations. I I expected a little more out of Ricky Burns. I think he's lost a step. Uh, Lee Selby ekes one out there. A lot of people had that fight a draw. But Lee Selby is now a lightweight and a ranked lightweight at that. Let's see what he can do. Okay, let's come to the United States. Uh, Reno Sparks Convention Center in Reno, Nevada, top rank on ESPN+. Plus. Shakur Stevenson improves to 13-0 with a unanimous decision win over Joette Gonzalez. Wins the vacant WBO featherweight title. So, okay, let's start with the good. Shakur Stevenson. Looked spectacular in this fight. Spectacular. Uh, Really didn't set the world on fire. Didn't knock out, obviously, Gonzalez. Didn't really hurt him at any point. But what he did was nullify everything Gonzalez wanted to do. Anytime Gonzalez tried to get inside, he'd just touch him. Just touch him with a jab. Whether it was to the chest, to the body, up top, and turn him. Just kept touching him, turning him, touching him, turning him. Boxing 101. Simple, basic, I say basic, not in a demeaning way, just boxing fundamentals. And Stevenson looked so much bigger, faster, crisper, and he obviously had a much superior game plan. I don't know what the hell Gonzalez and his team were were trying to do in there. All the bad blood and everything they had, I never saw Gonzalez empty the tank. He looked frustrated. He looked like a fish out of water. He looked like he didn't belong in the same world with Stevenson, at least not in the ring. I got to say this. I got to say this. I think that Joette Gonzalez, being an L.A. guy, being an undefeated L.A. guy, probably came into this fight a little overrated by the Southern California boxing press. And that's where I cut my teeth. That's where I came up in this business. So I understand how these things work. 
I think they liked the guy, saw him in the gym, talked to him, buddy, buddy, and overrated the guy a little bit. That's not to put him down. It's just now you look back, 2020 hindsight, how the hell did we ever think this fight was going to be competitive? Because we all thought, I thought Stevenson was going to win. I told you guys last week Stevenson was going to win, but I thought it'd be somewhat competitive. It wasn't at all. It was a complete mismatch. I think that perhaps Shakur Stevenson is a little underrated at this point and really has matured a little bit as a fighter in front of our eyes. He's with a really good team, really good team, and he's learning, and he's settling into his man strength a little bit. You guys remember when he first started out, there was a fight he had at, at that time, what was called the StubHub Center, and I was there watching it with Steve Kim ringside. I remember telling Steve, he's got Bambi legs. That was my term to describe Shakur Stevenson. He was really unsteady on his legs, kind of wobbly, just, just did not look strong. Well, it was the complete opposite Saturday night in Reno. He looked very strong, very steady on his legs. He has grown up and matured. He is living up to uh, all the advertisement that Top Rank has put out about the kid, okay? But I, some people may be jumping the gun a little too big, kind of like with the Josh Taylor thing. Obviously, what Josh Taylor accomplished Saturday was much, much more. But Shakur Stevenson, in my opinion, guys, this was his 13th pro fight. He is a prospect with a title. Now, let me explain. I'm not saying... He should avoid other top challenges. I'm not saying that he's not a great-looking prospect with a really bright future. He has a title. You guys always hear me talk about the distinction between a champion and a title holder. Josh Taylor became a champion of a division Saturday. Before that, he was a title holder. Right now, Shakur Stevenson is a guy with 13 pro fights, has a world title, not a champion yet, still developing. How old is he? I think he's 22. I think he's 22 years old. Correct me if I'm wrong on that. I believe he's 22, 23 years old. He's really young. He's got so much room to grow. So I think it's a little too soon to talk about throwing him in. I've heard some people saying he should fight Devin Haney. I saw a few people on Twitter saying that. Devin Haney is at 135. Stevenson's at 126. Pump the brakes on that shit. Let these guys develop a little bit. I don't want to see Haney fight Lomachenko yet. Yeah, so I saw one parade says Shakur's uh, talking Warrington. Yeah, I was going to get to that. Let me stop rambling. They called out Josh Warrington. And I do think that fight's going to happen because not only did Shakur Stevenson say it, but so did Bob Arum. I'll say this about top rank, guys. They really know what they're doing. Top rank, is the they have the best matchmakers in the sport. They really know what they're doing. When they take a risk, it's a highly calculated risk. Remember when Ramirez fought Hooker earlier this year? I thought Hooker was going to edge that fight out. Looking back now, I'm like, how the hell did I ever think that? But I thought Maurice Hooker, it being in Texas, where he's from, I thought he was going to eke out a close decision maybe and survive some scary moments, but eke out a points win. I really thought that. And they knew, top rank knew, it's worth the risk. We'll go over to the zone and get their money. We'll fight over there. And we're going to beat Hooker and take his title. They saw something. They really know what they're doing over at top rank. So with this Stevenson-Gonzalez fight, they're like, yeah, it's his 13th pro fight, but it's for a title. And this guy's tailor-made for him. They see something in Warrington that they feel confident enough Bob Aram said this. Grandpa Bob said, we're willing to go over to London and fight Warrington there to unify titles. That tells me right now, guys, they see something in Warrington that they can exploit. I'll tell you right now, bet the bank Stevenson's going to go over to the UK and win pretty handedly against Josh Warrington. Trust me. Top rank knows what they're doing. Yeah, Navajo Boxing says Warrington lacks power. Agreed. So there's a pattern here. So far, Stevenson has not fought anybody that hits very hard. He hasn't fought anybody as big and physically strong as he is. Now, Warrington's a pretty strong guy, and he's a pretty physical fighter. But he's limited in the skill department. Stevenson, one of the great things that I've noticed is he sees everything coming. Everything. I think he's going to dominate Warrington. Now, it's not going to be a 12-0 type of thing. 
but it's going to be 9-3, something like that. I'm telling you right now, Grandpa Bob does not take risks like this unless he sees something. They know what they're doing at top rank. Just trust their process, okay? Uh, so Stevenson, again, I call him a prospect with the title because look who he beat to get this title. Look how many fights he has. Is Joette Gonzalez a top 10 featherweight? No, he's not. This is kind of like when Canelo Alvarez beat Rocky Fielding at 168. Rocky Fielding is not a top 10 super middleweight. So I don't rate Canelo's title at super middleweight worth any. It's not worth a damn. It's worth this paper that my notes are typed on. Okay. And I could say that about so many other fighters. All right. Right now, Stevenson, now look, he goes over to the UK and he beats Josh Warrington over there and takes a second title. That's huge. And I, I think he's probably going to do it. But I want to see him develop further. Okay, Uh, way too soon for pound for pound talk and all that kind of stuff. But he's going to be very tough to beat in that division. Does that mean I think he could go beat Leo Santa Cruz right now? No, I don't necessarily think that. I think Warrington is the logical next step. And then a couple other fights to develop him a little further and then maybe move up to 130 or whatever it is. But top rank is very, very good at getting uh, unification fights. So let's see if if Shakur Stevenson can unify things at featherweight. I think that'd be awesome. Uh, One statistic that really jumped out at me, Joette Gonzalez landed four of 128 jabs, 3%. He landed 3% of his jabs, four jabs in an entire fight. It's not that he didn't throw many. He threw a lot. He threw over 10 around. He landed four in the whole fight. I see a few of you guys talking about Shakur Stevenson versus Gary Russell Jr., I'd love to see it, but Gary Russell Jr., look, I tried to give the guy the benefit of the doubt for a little while. I've lost all faith in him. Apparently, he was offered a fight with Leo Santa Cruz and turned it down. He's a nobody again. Like, he, he's just not a serious boxer, and I don't think he's ever going to fight Shakur Stevenson. I'd love to see it. I'd love to see it, but I don't think it's going to happen. All right, let me see. Chris Bergen says, Warrington beat Shakur for me, and truth be known, agrees with him. We shall find out. I just think for Bob Arum to be talking like that and be so confident and them going to not only fight in Warrington, but going over to the UK to do it, they see something in him. I'm telling you guys right now. Chris Bergen says Warrington is an unbelie- or a bulldog, unbelievable engine. I completely agree with you. He's going to give 12 great rounds to Shakur Stevenson and give him some moments of adversity that he has to get through. It's going to be a great learning experience for Stevenson. And then Stevenson's going to win 117, 111. I'm telling you right now. That's why Grandpa Bob wants to pull the trigger on that fight. Okay, PBC on Showtime, Reading, Pennsylvania. Erickson Lubin, unanimous decision win in the 10-rounder against Nathaniel Gallimore. He is now 4-0 since that KO1 loss to Jamel Charlo. Still only 24 years old, getting better. Do I see a future champion? Not necessarily. But I see a guy who's always going to be hanging around the top 10 fringe contender uh, perennial contender and make for some damn good fights. Robert Easter, unanimous decision win over Adrian Granados at 140 pounds. His first fight at super lightweight, perhaps Easter's most entertaining fight. The scores were a little bit too wide. I thought the scores were way too wide. It was a close competitive fight, but Easter was the right guy. The decision went to the right man. Easter won that fight and it was actually entertaining. Hard to be in a boring fight against Adrian Granados. And then Sunday, October 27th, from Hollywood, Sergei Bohachuk, the Ukrainian who now lives and trains out of Big Bear, California, just 24 years old, improved a 16-0 with a KO4 win over Philadelphia's Tyrone Brunson. And of course, uh, Bohachuk is a prospect at junior middleweight to keep an eye on. I don't want to jump the gun. This is another one where I think some people might be jumping the gun here. I think Bohachuk's not quite ready to... Uh, Go for a title yet, maybe toward the end of next year. He needs another year of seasoning. Brunson, very experienced fighter. He's fought Tony Harrison, Caleb Plant, Dennis Hogan, Kermit Cintron, some other good fighters. Now, look, he lost all those fights, but he's got that experience being in with those kind of fighters. And you see what those guys went on to do. Harrison has a title. Plant has a title. Hogan, many people feel, should have a title with what he did against Munguia. Cintron is a former titleist. So Bohachek is on the right path. 
right? Dropped him uh, in the third, twice in the fourth. This was a nice step up win, but still, he's like a steak that just needs a little more seasoning. Not quite ready. It's a little too rare. If you want to get it to medium rare, a couple more fights in late next year, he'll be ready to contend for a title, I feel. Okay, guys, a few questions, and then we're going to jump off here. Let's see. Um, James Burrell says, I usually agree with you and the Bob Father, but not on this one. All right, guys, look. And the one prayed said, if it goes to a decision in the UK, Warrington will win. Well, you know what? It's that divided opinion that makes me want to see the fight. I, I think that's going to be just in terms of styles. I'll tell you this. Warrington would do what many people thought uh, Gonzalez was going to be able to do. I just think Gonzalez was overrated by people in the Southern California media. They've done that with several fighters. And, you know, I moved away a year ago, so I haven't been around to see Joe Gonzalez or anything. <clears throat> so I didn't know what to think one way or another. I relied on the word of some of my peers out there who have seen him, and I just think we're overrating the guy a little bit. That's just what I feel. And it's not the first time. It won't be the last. It happens in New York with some of the New York media and some of the New York prospects. And that just happens. You know, it's just part of the thing. Let's see. Fossil27 says, Mike, I still think Progre is number two. I think that Zapata beat Ramirez and rate Progre higher since he never looked mediocre. He proved himself against Taylor than Ramirez versus Hooker. You know what? It's a good point. It's a good point. And again, we're kind of splitting hairs here because it's close. I'll just say at this point, because Ramirez has two titles, technically he's undefeated. You could make an argument. He got a a gift in that one fight you mentioned. But per the record, he's got two titles, undefeated. You put him at number one. You put Progre at number two right now. That's just kind of the protocol. You know what I'm saying? But if you feel Progre is number one and Ramirez is number two, I ain't mad at you. Again, we're splitting hairs. It's close. Rockstar1996 says, Carlos Monzon has a TV series made about him. Check it out on Netflix. Cool, man. Me and Tiffany have been looking for something to watch. There's nothing on TV right now. So cool. I appreciate that. We'll check that out. Goodfellas Pulp Fiction asks, who fought better competition, Oscar De La Hoya or Sugar Ray Leonard? That is a good question. We're going to end the show on that. Good question. I'm going to give the edge to Sugar Ray Leonard. Um, Now, he waited Hagler out. I thought maybe Hagler beat him, but um, st- overall, Leonard fought and beat better opposition than Oscar did. Oscar, you know, he benefited from being a star. And, you know, a lot of people felt that Felix Sturm beat him. He took some great challenges, like against Bernard Hopkins and stuff, but he came short in those fights where he took big challenges. But I think Leonard, look, Sugar Ray Leonard might be the best fighter ever. You hear about Sugar Ray Robinson being the best fighter ever. Sometimes I think Sugar Ray Leonard may have been better than Sugar Ray Robinson. When you really start looking at what that man accomplished in the ring. uh, Now, look, Hawker's saying Sugar Ray Leonard cherry-picked more than... Cherry-picked? He he cherry-picked Thomas Hearns? He cherry-picked... Duran? I don't know about that, dude. I, I, I don't know. You can't cherry pick those guys. Now, north of like 154, and you know, his fight against Daniel Lalonde. Yeah. Yeah, okay. That that's he was Canelo at that point. Fine. That was kind of Floydish, Canelo-ish, Oscar. They all kind of do that. I'm talking about prime years, dude. What he did at welterweight, I mean it was great stuff. And all the way up to middleweight, even if he waited out Hagler or he was a little long in the tooth and everything. Um, look, at Floyd Mayweather would have never taken that fight. And Leonard did. Floyd Mayweather would have never taken that kind of challenge at any point in, in, in his opponent's career. Leonard still did. So I think the man deserves tremendous credit. I'm going to give the edge to Leonard in that one, man. And I know we can... Uh, yeah. <laughs> Who is it that said that? Just uh, Emeli Anamone said that uh, I opened up quite a can of worms there, sir. Yes, 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 a show did. Because these arguments will go on till the end of time. Uh, Como Revy says, compare Oscar's resume to Floyd's. No contest, Oscar. Yes, I completely agree. Now, Oscar lost a lot of those fights. But when you look at the 
opposition he fought. Just uh, on another level. I'll, I'll end with this. And I, I don't want to beat up on Floyd. Because Floyd was a great fighter, obviously. But Floyd had an opportunity to fight Sergio Martinez, who was at the time the middleweight champion. Sergio Martinez started as a welterweight, then a junior middleweight. At the time, was a middleweight champion, a little broken. Miguel Cotto said, you know what? I see something in this dude I can exploit. He saw something maybe not all of us saw. And he said, I'm going to move up to 160 and challenge Sergio Martinez. And we all thought he was nuts. We thought he was insane. And look what happened. Cotto beat him, became the middleweight champion, the lineal middleweight champion of the world, got a big fight against Canelo down the line that got him a ton of money, tens of millions of dollars, right? What if Floyd Mayweather had taken that challenge? What if Floyd had had the balls to say, man, I'm going to fight Sergio Martinez. And I want to say that fight was, was it Atlantic City, New York? It was somewhere on the East Coast. But what if Floyd had taken that kind of challenge and became the middleweight champion of the world? It would have changed his legacy. It would have changed uh, guys like me who criticize, and not just me, but Doug Fisher. Uh, Steve Kim's talked about this. A lot of very respected people, way above my pay grade, who have been doing this shit way longer than me, have talked about the lack of Floyd's top challenges. You know what I'm saying? In the prime of his career. Could have changed that narrative. Could have changed that narrative altogether. But... Jack Alter says it was at MSG. Okay, yeah, I thought it was in New York. Thanks, Jack. Imagine that Floyd stepped up and taken a challenge and fought Sergio Martinez in New York in one and became the lineal, legitimate middleweight champion of the world and retired after that. Completely changed his legacy, in my opinion. Completely. But he didn't. Guys like Oscar did. Guys like Ray Leonard did. We could pick apart some of their fights and say they cherry-picked here, cherry-picked there. They got a gift here, got a gift there. But they took the challenges. And that's something some of these newer fighters seem less willing to do. We're going to leave it at that, guys. I'll see you Thursday night on Halloween. It's going to be a lot of fun. And remember, we got another fight party coming up this Saturday. That's going to be a hell of a lot of fun. I'll see you at the fights. 